So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observe a very good, a good afternoon to you all. I'm Ms. Vanisha, research and lecturer uh, of the Faculty of Management of Amity Mauritius. I would like to seize this uh, golden opportunity of thanking Digital for uh, this uh, opportunity in giving me uh, the chance of presenting our research paper and the theme, Definite the Possibility or Deliberate Mistake, a Comparative Study of Undergraduate Students' Academic Performance in the Traditional versus the Online Pedagogy in Mauritius. So this paper would not have been uh, possible without the help and collaboration of my co-author, uh, co Professor Ashish Karikar, who is also the Dean of Faculty of Amity Mauritius. The impact of COVID-19 in Mauritius has given um, a new paradigm to e-education with this kind of interactivity based on uh, teaching and learning between students and teachers through the use of the online platform. Uh, we can see that a new arena of hope has really burst and therefore uh, is giving the online pedagogy that we call now the new normal uh, reflecting it as an epitome of effectiveness. But still, uh, there are a mixed feeling whereby people are still uh, having more preference for the traditional mode, saying that it is the best. So in this paper, we're going to go and explore in depth the practicability and realistic nature of the traditional and online uh, uh, pedagogy of undergraduate student academic performance in a designated university, a private one. Unfortunately, due to confidentiality of uh, the paper, I cannot disclose the uh, institution. And uh, here we're going to have a, a more in-depth analysis of the transition from online to, uh, from traditional to online in the era, in the time of March, 2020, when COVID should uh, Mauritius. So, um, sorry. So here we're going to use a single uh, indicator. So we're going to use the semester one students' uh, academic performance at this university. So we are comparing uh, four of the modules in semester one for uh, several cohorts that we call batch batches here in Mauritius. So uh, from the literature review, we have classified it in three main basics. So this avenue of the web-based teaching and learning has really continuously boasted for its numerous advantages over the traditional mode. So especially for those who are currently working, especially students who are working. And here in that um, university, I would say that there are a mix of students and a lot of students from Africa who are studying in that university. And uh, so they are currently uh, working or doing studies on a slow paced basis. So this is really giving um, more of an, uh, an advantage to those students and uh, also to students who can uh, at leisure have uh, their, their studies being done uh, with only a single connection. So they can connect through the platform like Moodle, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, or even Zoom, or now uh, this university, they're using the MST. So as for the UNESCO research that we have- um, Please, and thank you for your time. This research is focused on a student's perspective. Um, yes. It's on the academic performance. On the fourth adoption of online learning at a private higher education institution. The summary yeah. of this presentation consists of a background, literature review, methodology, findings, recommendations, and conclusions. Uh, yes. Okay. I think that was someone's recording. Please continue, Ms. Venetia. Okay, all right, yes. So as for the UNESCO research uh, done in April, 2020, so we've seen that 188 countries and university have been really massively affected by the closure due to uh, the impact of COVID-19 and 91% of overall students have been affected. So in order to sustain the classes and really to, uh, to, to continue, so it was uh, thought that the online uh, platform would be very much advantageous to the students. So some researchers uh, have also uh, been having um, quite a mixed feeling about it. 
So in order, since it is an application to the Mauritius platform, so we have also compared with uh, some of the researchers here uh, in Mauritius, which like, for example, I would cite in 2010, uh, 2020, sorry, like uh, uh, Professor uh, Ram Kizun, in his research paper, he's mentioned that there has been uh, online pedagogy, which has really surfaced students to attend online uh, examination, submit their assignments, and to continue to focus in their respective classes. So with the advent of this search done by the World Economic Forum in 2020, we can see that there is also a need uh, what we call the 21st century education, this revolution to have students not only uh, just attend classes, but also to develop some kind of, of uh, mastery level in, in their skills to be future employer, employable um, em employable in, in the near future in Mauritius. So yet online uh, mode is stigmatized. So in this uh, third uh, Phase, we are looking at whether it is uh, a necessity or a rhetorical dissonance here. So yet the online mode is stigmatized as a weaker option to sustain quality. So no in university can impose online framework due to the absence of resources. So to what extent can traditional modes be a substitute to online? So this is a questionable and through this research we're going to have uh, in-depth analysis. So the objective of this paper, uh, we have uh, had uh, firstly to see the effectiveness of the online pedagogy compared to the traditional one in this COVID era, to assess the level of perception of undergraduate students with regards to online pedagogy by focusing on their attitude behavior as well as cognizance to this mode of new modes of teaching and to compare the performance of undergraduate students achieved through online pedagogy with traditional face-to-face -face over uh, the last three years that is from two th April 2018 up to August 2020. So this gave rise to research question uh, Research question one, what differentiates the performance of undergraduate students between online and uh, online mode and face-to-face? -face? The second research question, which was in terms of the attitude, so how far, what was the impact that they had on these two uh, modes of pedagogy? And also, are there any significant difference that was being sought when, uh, with regards to the students' IQ? So the research methodology of this paper, as mentioned, it is uh, to focus on undergraduate students of faculty of management. So those students who are doing a BBA from six respective cohorts in four different modules, which are principles of management, microeconomics, business stats and math, and computer in management. And also there was uh, the focus on the SDPA, which was also taken into consideration with regards to their performance. So the ethical consideration since this paper involves human uh, uh, participants and figures, so it was uh, really uh, considered in terms of its confidential nature, so nothing was being disclosed uh, to uh, due to the Data Protection Act of Mauritius. So the data collection, the sample of 90 students created in total were obtained by the examination unit and released the grades. So it was under the approval of this university's vice chancellor. So coming now, there were six cohorts. So the six cohort, meaning the six batches. And in order to have like a, an, uh, something uh, equivalent, so we've taken 15 students because it was uh, not all the cohorts had the same number of students. So we have taken uh, taken a cut of, of 15 students and in total 360 uh, 60, uh, results were being compared. So in these cohorts from uh, August, uh, April 2018 to uh, August 2021. So the test instrument, so here we have used uh, final module grading, that is what we call the SGPA. The module grades were derived from class tests, research projects, assignment quiz, uh, in class debates role play and also the end of semester examination and also uh, all the assessments were fully valid and relevant and they were effective in gauging the students uh, ability and performance 
and each module will assess their on uh, the same markings, which is 100 marks, and all the students' performance were anal analyzed. So in order to further test uh, what the research question, so we have devised uh, some hypotheses to test the first research question. So hypothesis one is the overall student's academic performance is significant between traditional and the online mode. This was rejected because when we did the um, this uh, test, we could see that uh, there was no significant difference because um, cohort one to three and those cohorts who did only face to face and to those four to six, they were fully online. So uh, we can see further that uh, their results were not that significant and uh, it was only mild uh, differences from the mean score of the students. The hypothesis uh, were further tested. So hypothesis two was tested, uh, two, three, and four were tested uh, based on research question two. So out of it, we can see that there was a difference between practical and theoretical uh, modules because students performance were better in uh, modules that, that were more uh, like for example compute and management they did uh, better compared to uh, to modules which were mostly literature and uh, all these uh, online modules were these modules were also subject to turn it in so when we can see the concept of compute and management students were more uh, acquainted to this compared to where they had to learn a lot of uh, and then to deliver. So research question three uh, was based on the significant difference between online and face-to-face -face with regards to the IQ. So we can see that following uh, the graph, uh, the mean show that the students academic performance were relatively the same from online or to uh, to the uh, traditional. So same uh, SGP were so little uh, difference were being uh, mentioned, but in total, when you see the grading, it was ranked from a C minus or a B minus. So in order to conclude uh, on to um, this research, so the academic performance of undergraduate students remain unchanged from 2018 to 2020 in all the respective cohorts. It is true to say that the impact of COVID-19 has really created a reorientation uh, towards giving more synergistic and I would say a complementary perspective to learners through the online platform. But there exists no quick fix solution, but rather to accept that in the long term, uh, the, this higher education institute will require a mix of both online and traditional pedagogy to continue to, uh, to run uh, effectively for the student, to meet the student's academic performance. So some of the recommendations, so future recommendations should be uh, considered in the teaching ways of both online and traditional classes. So the quality should also be an important factor to be considered and to continue having a blended uh, a hybrid pedagogy instead of just shifting to online uh, because after the pandemic uh, there there is a possibility everything will go back to normal even though the new normal is online to put in place a quality assurance monitoring system which will cater for effective teaching and learning to sustain engagement and to have proper KPIs of academicians on how to improve their online teaching learning, which would contribute to having students' performance better, and to continue to do survey to evaluate the possibilities of students' accessibility to resources like Moodle, social media, and uh, MS Team, where lectures are usually being conducted. And also, since here in Mauritius, more focus is being put on the Bloom taxonomy, it is also to provide some uh, trainings to the faculties so that they can implement this uh, concept of the room taxonomy. So considering the limitation of the research, uh, here we've seen that there is only a sample of cohorts. Now uh, taking this institution, there are more uh, students, there are more cohorts. So only undergraduate students' skills and ability were being taken with respect to the online and the traditional mode. The study focuses essentially on secondary data provided by the examination unit. And uh, 
it also has a limit of the period that it was being done because it is April 2018 up to August 2021. And in addition to only comparing the efficacy of online and traditional modes, so future research should also be focused on the effectiveness of blended or hybrid mode. So this was it. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the session. Um, the, the, I'm uh, going to talk about this honest blockchain course, which we introduced. Um, I'm in the Department of Computing Sciences at Nelson Mandela University. Um, Professor Margaret Cullen, my co-author, um, is with the Business School, and Mr. Martin Stolk is one of my very good, excellent ex-students who started his own IT company uh, in Port Elizabeth. Uh, he's got about 30 people employed with him. And he and part of the company develops blockchain technology. And without him, I would never have been able to present this course because he did all the practical side of the course. And, um, and he's got a lot of experience with blockchain. So this afternoon, I'm just going to give you a bit of background on blockchain. And then specifically on blockchain courses, I'll be looking at some research problem and the research objective of the study, the methodology which we use, and I'm going to present you with some results at the end and some final conclusions. So one of the things about computer science is, is that computer programming is considered difficult and it's fairly abstract. You know, we've got first year students right to senior students that's really sometimes struggle with programming the concepts and specifically the structures. Traditionally, computer programming is taught face to face. Um, you need an instructor which uh, can, can lead you through your programming, teaching you to program. And then when you come to practicals, you need some student assistance, you need some advices, you, you need help. And, and that is very important when learning to program. We at the university usually use senior students to help junior students. So we've got third years helping second years and second years helping first years um, in the labs where, the, where they work. However, with COVID-19 in, in 2020, things changed for us drastically. We couldn't go into the labs at the university. We couldn't, we were forced to use online tools and technologies and it's changed. Research in the literature shows that um, on-site teaching of programming courses uh, with uh, online teaching has only recently, basically COVID forced us to go that way. And they found in the literature that students learning to program experience stress and anxiety working remotely. So um, from the literature, it really shows that when you're learning to program that those are some of the difficulties which you experience. Blockchain on the other hand has become very famous with, with the start of Bitcoin. And specifically when Bitcoin was reaching very high prices, uh, people People started buying Bitcoin and companies started accepting Bitcoin as an exchange. Uh, it became popularity and it runs on a blockchain. A blockchain course requires new technologies, new program environments and new concepts which students are not used to and are not taught in the first undergraduate years of computer science and programming. So the blockchain course was something totally new. Um, the blockchain courses into smart contracts and smart contracts are self-enforcing pieces of software which reside and run over hosting blockchain. And you use something yeah, called Ethereum. And I'm gonna just explain Ethereum a bit later on my next slide, um, that it's a platform to we use where you can develop a blockchain on. Um, teaching and learning to write computer programming specifically courses related to, uh, in the COVID period, basically went to uh, students had to do a lot of online um, learning. Um, and with that, there are various platforms, as I show you at the bottom here, which allows you to do uh, blockchain courses and, and, and give you assistance. 
Um, just to show you, this is some of the blockchain code um, which is written. It is very complex. Um, I've just extracted some. What you see here for the students when they write, these are can run into hundreds of pages of code that runs like this, which accesses the, the, the blockchain. This is uh, my first 2018 uh, student class, um, which we developed. Um, I developed the theoretical part of, of the blockchain course. It was the first honest blockchain course that was present, developed and presented in South Africa. And Martin here in front, he presented the whole practical side of implementing the blockchain course. It is done in the fourth year of the honors. I presented the theoretical part and Martin the practical. Um, it introduced you to the concept of how to implement the blockchain. Um, we use the Ethereum platform. Now, if you look at the bottom here, you'll see here is a Bitcoin. And this other one is Ether. Ether is the same as Bitcoin. And for you, you are, are investment, uh, interest in investment, you will see that Ether is at the bottom yet doing much better than Bitcoin at the moment. So Ethereum is a platform where you develop a blockchain on, but Ethereum has also got a, a, a which is called Ether. So it's got dual purposes. And Ether, if I say to people, um, if they ask me, must I buy Bitcoin? I always say, go and look at Ether and invest in Ether as well, because I believe that is the, the, the cryptocurrency of the future. They develop their own programs in blockchain, the students, and they use smart contracts. And during the practicals, they, they write uh, small uh, blockchain programs. And then at the end, we implement a real world blockchain. What we did uh, with this is over a six week period, we developed a blockchain, which is for a, a, a special um, animal race, uh, uh, animals which we, which we put onto a blockchain and we record the animal's details from the day it's born right through to when it is slaughtered and it's packaged and it's placed, uh, the, 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 the meat is available in the supermarket. Um, so you can track that whole animal through its life until the time you buy the meat and, um, and that is all put on a blockchain. So that is a final project, which is an Angus beef project, which we do at the The study is basically what was the impact of COVID-19 um, on the honest blockchain course. Um, so you try to determine what was the difference between the pre-COVID and the people that conduct, did the course in the COVID period. What was their experiences? It uh, was qualitative analyzed. Uh, we set up a questionnaire with uh, open-ended questions. The questions focus mainly on the course experience of the students each year, the difficulties which they experience, and what improvements they can recommend to the course. We captured the, the uh, uh, questionnaire on Question Pro, and as you'll see a bit later, uh, we use theme frequency and association diagrams to show the responses and the themes of the of all the students. This is a study done by Professor Cullen last year relating to MBA students going online and the difficulties they experienced in South Africa. And the most important things which the previous uh, showed that the MBA students were very high data cost and connectivity programs in South Africa, specifically during load shedding um, times, which was a problem, um, specifically for the MBA and having family and kids around uh, was, was some of them said that 10 students said that the home environment and having family kids is, uh, provided a lot of difficulty. And then a lot of them struggled with the technology and some also had emotional stress. So this is what the MBA students did. So let's look at our results. In the data of my um, uh, blockchain course for three years, um, unfortunately, my year 20, 20, 
three students in the class. So it was 12 students, eight students, and three students. This is the total population of the class. So um, I couldn't, it was not a sample. This is the population uh, which we, had. we see some of them were living with their parents, uh, but during the COVID time, everybody was at home uh, working, living with their parents and working from home. So, uh, a uh, question which we which we analyzed how did you find studying the blockchain course so if you if you look at the students here um generally everybody said the course is very technical which it is it is a very very technical college it's all new it is extremely challenging um they all use new technologies and it's very time consuming um, a lot of the students found the course very difficult and frustrating um, the practical components were very long, and, um, but it was cutting edge. It was leading edge, and the students that completed this course work um, in the blockchain environment fairly easy after they, uh, after they finished the course. The difficult experience in the pre-COVID period, which the, course, the students mentioned, were the long lectures. Uh, specifically the practical lectures, the, they were fairly long. They found the tech very difficult, uh, specifically having access to software. You had to run, run the Ethereum platform at home. Uh, so that, is, that, could, that was a problem. Um, and having your technology at home, that's what they found. The students in 2020 really wanted face-to-face -face interaction. Um, they found that the access and academic expertise in the online environment is not the same as in the uh, real world face-to-face -face environment. You can't pop in to the lecturer's office and ask him or her, what is happening here? Why is my program not running? I'm struggling. What am I doing wrong? So that is, that is a big, big uh, drawback for them. They also don't have access to peers' expertise. The honor students can go to the master students and they can go and they can um, ask them to, for assistance, which is something which, which really helps in, 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 in this environment. They had to use blockchain forums. They had to go onto the internet. They had to use YouTube to go and, and, and solve problems. And that made them feel very stressful and very emotional challenging. So, so the 2018 pre-COVID group, they wanted improvements with shorter lectures, access for software at home, longer practice, practicals with more um, assistance, and they wanted more forced lab sessions where people sit in the labs and they have to do the, their blockchain development there. The 2020 group said they want mask-to-mask -mask interaction. They want access to the academic expertise. They want access to peer, peer expertise. And um, they made extensively use of, of blockchain um, forums, help on the internet and things like that. And they were very much on their own. So the difference from a lecturer side between the two groups group was very more theoretical. Um, the post, uh, the COVID group had a much more practical experience. They had a, basically a much more real world experience. Um, something which you work, when you go to work in the industry, you have to solve problems yourself. You have to go and, and, um, and, and research things. So they had a, a, a limited resources with very little help. And, um, and, and they, that, that made them struggle, but it also taught them some other skills which were more practical and more research oriented exposure. The 2020 group had to solve blockchain code related problems, solving programming forums, internet sites, they used YouTube videos, blockchain blogs, and that's what they, they did. They all asked for face-to-face -face assistance. That's one thing that they said they would like to have had be back in the lab and everybody would like to have a lecture, be in lectures and work in that, in, in that regard. 
Um, they also found every all the students found the course technical, challenging, and time-consuming. And then additionally, COVID 20 class found the course um, access to peers assistance, experience high costs, and they mentioned in stress and emotional challenges. Just like other studies have found that teaching to program is, is it causes stress and emotional. And, uh, and that's something which we have to take cognizance of in the future and how we're going to support our students. Thank you, my president. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Hi, my name is Tanya Prinsloo, and I was very fortunate to work with Pariksha Singh on this paper. And what's interesting about our paper is that the changes that we implemented, we actually implemented before COVID. So everything that's been done here is not at all related to anything that happened after COVID. Uh, I just want to see how I get to my next slide. Oh, it seems to have frozen. Um, there I go. Okay, so as an introduction, um, what we as an institution would like to achieve is to have more lifelong learning skills being transferred. And we've seen that it's widely recognized as being very beneficial and useful. So we don't want to teach students something that they just study for the exam. We want to teach them a skill that they can take with them forever. And we found that the Sage Pastel model module is very conducive for that because it not only um, follows principles such as learning for understanding but also applying knowledge to solve problems. Now we do understand that not all modules can go the lifelong learning route but we would like to encourage the, the modules that can to do that and what we've seen is um, we see that it's a better way of teaching accounting students because instead of just having the top-down approach where students study for the exam and then forget everything, they now have to incorporate it into the accounting module and they also now have to be able to apply it when they leave the university. So we really want to equip them with something that they can use for the rest of their life. Now, just as an example, one of the earliest lifelong learning skills that you learn is to read and to write. And that's probably the biggest skill you'll ever learn. But we're just saying that it shouldn't stop there and that students should be equipped to study and to learn in a lifelong learning manner. So what we decided to do with a planning going into 2020, we said that we want to change the curriculum and we want to include Sage Pastel as an integral part of the accounting module. Now, why we wanted to do that is because the accounting module said that they no longer want to do paper-based assignments. They want the students to do their assignments in Sage Pastel. And for that reason, we decided to have it run from about April till September, no longer being semester-based, because we felt that um, in between January and, and March, the students need to learn the accounting principles. But from there onwards, they have to apply it. So we changed it to a continuous assessment model. Um, and we think that that is also good for lifelong learning. And I'll touch on that a bit later. So instead of writing an exam, the students still write two semester tests, but they have to complete a lot of ass assignments. And as going forward, the assignments continue in second and third year, but it no longer counts for this specific module. So it's something that they know that they teach, they're learning this for something going into the future as well. Sorry, I just have a, a, something on my screen that I try to want to get uh, rid of. Okay, there I go. Okay, so some of the principles of lifelong learning that we really thought was very important for Sage Pastel was to teach for understanding. So we don't want them to go and study the textbook. We want them to understand the book. So we, we, we included an interactive ebook and some online videos that they can use for their understanding. But in terms of application, they have to apply the knowledge in their accounting module. So it's not a loose standing module on its own, it is actually incorporated into accounting. And then we also felt that the method of teaching, we rather want to teach, for, for, teach the accounting concepts rather than teaching the accounting facts for them. In terms of the literature review, 
um, human learning, we say, is defined as a process that in living organisms leads to permanent capacity change and which is not solely due to biological maturation or aging. So human learning is something that is forced. You have to apply your mind in order to learn. And some of the basic learning processes involve an external in, inter, interaction between the learner and the environment or the internal process of acquisition and elaboration. Now, in terms of the dimensions of learning, you'll see that we've got the context, we've got the incentive, and we've got the interact interaction and how they all link together. In the incentive dimension, this is where you need the energy to learn. You learn best if you are in a good mental state. In the interactive uh, dimension, you initiate the art of learning, you go into action. It will help also if you have a basic understanding of what you are learning. Therefore, the context dimension is very important. Put together and you have the relevant skills to allow you to learn something successfully. So all of these things have to be in place for you to be able to successfully learn a new skill. And I think some of the things that people don't appreciate are the value of emotions. People are not always in a good emotional state and that can lead to them not being able to learn. And that unfortunately, that is something that the university cannot address. And I think it's so important that we also understand that this changing times led to a lot of emotions in students. And that might be one of the reasons why they struggle to learn, especially in a continuous uh, assessment module. Now, some of the other things that we have to take into account are things like how adults learn. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I just wanna to touch on a few of them. And some of them, adults want to seek meaning in experiences. So they want to link meaning to an experience that they felt. So they felt that there's meaning into studying a new course because I can apply it in my life, in my professional development going forward, that is very useful. Adults need, need to engage in mindful activities. So also, they want their mind to be used, they want to be engaged with what they're busy with. And then the other one I want to touch on is adults learn by their frame of reference being transformed. And I think one of the things that we must remember is that if you never grow, you never learn. And that's one of the things that you have to understand that if you are going into a lifelong learning skill, you grow as a person. Then the four pillars of lifelong learning, and I found that very helpful going forward and looking at the concept of lifelong learning. The first one is learning to know, then learning to do, learning to live together, and learning to be. And just in terms of learning to know, you have to master the use of specific tools. With learning to do, you have to ensure that people can accomplish their tasks or perform their jobs. Learning to live together relates to managing conflict, respecting other cultures, and becoming an active member of society. Finally, learning to be is an overall personal development of the mind, body, and spirit. So I think that incorporates a lot of very fundamental concepts. So what we then did is we said, we have got this large cohort of students that's taking Sage Pastel Accounting, and we want to find out a few number of things from there. So we had three research questions. The first one is we wanted to find out if lifelong learning is a better way of teaching accounting students. Is it better than giving them a final year exam and then they pass or fail, or is it better to incorporate that as a lifelong learning skill? Then we also wanted to see how can Sage Pastel effectively be introduced as a lifelong learning skill for university students. And we know that it can't happen for all subjects, but we would like to see it happen in more subjects. And then what are students' perceptions of Sage Pastel regarding it being introduced into a first year accounting module where lifelong learning skills are incorporated? Now, I'm not going to address all of the re research questions one by one. Uh, I will address them as a whole and then we will conclude. But what we did is we decided that we, we want to ask the students themselves what they think. So we had to go through a long process of ethical clearance and then we created an online link for the students to complete the Qualtrics questionnaire because it's easy to incorporate that into Blackboard and get the students to uh, answer the survey. 
So it was entire, entirely voluntary. There was nothing forced. There was no incentives. Um, and then we found that uh, out of the whole large cohort of students, I think it was about 2,000 students, 363 completed the questionnaire, which is a response rate of about 16%, which is not that high, but given the large number that did conclude the, complete the questionnaire, we could make some good deductions. And the data was primarily quantitative, and we used SPSS version 27 to analyze the data. So first of all, just in terms of what we found was, if we asked the students if they found the assessments useful, because we wanted to see if the assessments link to lifelong learning and if they find that it helps them on their way. And the largest part of the group said strongly agree, slightly agree. Um, a few didn't agree or disagree and the small portion slightly or completely disagreed. Then do you feel that this module will help you in your personal development? And the reason why we asked personal development is because it's a lifelong learning skill and not all accounting students will go on becoming accountants. Some of them have it as an additional subject. And you can see, that, again, we have the same trend, strongly agree being the most out of, out of all the uh, responses. Then do you believe the subject would help you in your professional development? And they uh, very much show 207 students said strongly agree it helps them in the professional develop development. And then we also asked them what module resources that they find the most useful to understand the content. And what was interesting that we didn't expect was that they chose the ebook. Um, we would have thought the online Blackboard Collaborate sessions would have been the most useful, but they actually found the ebook to be the most useful. Second, the Blackboard and then the discussion boards and the videos. So there were a lot of resources that the students could use that they did find useful. Um, uh, do you prefer doing the assignments individually or as groups? Now, we, we found that 251, almost double, uh, said that they want the assignments done individually and not in groups. And I think the reason for that was the COVID pandemic. Students found it difficult to form groups because they didn't know each other. They found it difficult to get together in groups or to meet online and find a time where everyone could meet. And a lot of the students actually just felt, if I do it by myself, it's easier, it's quicker. We actually would like to in encourage group work because we feel that is more beneficial to them. So just in terms of the students, we had a word cloud in, in Atlas GI. These people that said they prefer um, working from home, said uh, for understanding, um, they find it difficult to meet in groups. It's difficult to meet online. They prefer being alone, that they can manage their own pace. Um, they can manage their own marks and so on. Whereas the people that said they would like to work in groups found it easier. Um, they have members of a team um, that work together, um, helps things along. So a lot of them felt, but it was quite difficult to understand because they probably a lot of them compared group work to individual work, which came out in the word cloud. And then just one of the cross tabulations that we did, uh, we students believe this course will help them in the personal development versus individual and group assessments. And we found that the individual students felt strongly that it helped with their personal development. Um, and we, we have a lower percentage of groups because the group numbers, people who chose the group option was a lot less. But strongly agree, slightly agree, and neither agree or disagree was the three main options that we found. Then some of the, the, the fine discussion on the findings. Um, the findings suggest that the accounting students taking the Sage Pastel model benefit from redesigning the model to suit lifelong learning better. We found that their overall marks improved. We found that uh, they better in, they easily comp, uh, incorporate Pastel now into the accounting module. So we do think it's beneficial. And then the reason why the continuous assessment approach we feel works very well is for and why it links so well with lifelong learning is we have a better standard of learning. Um, the basic premise is that students learn continuously rather than trying to memorize everything for the upcoming exam, which helps with lifelong learning. A higher quality of quality of demonstration, learners demonstrate their knowledge throughout the module. 
highlighting problem areas, students are able to identify problem areas much, much sooner and address it during the module, build on existing knowledge that they already built throughout the semester, and in higher levels of retention, students often apply what they've learned and their skills are displayed more frequently. So it's very important, I think, that if you want to plan a lifelong learning module, that you also look at the way that you assess. I'm not saying that you should all go the continuous assessment route, but a lot of the subjects that we force the students to parrot style, regurgitate everything in the exam is not really necessary and it can form part of a continuous assessment approach. Then one last thing that's very important about lifelong learning is that it's actually one of the sustainable development goals that we are trying to achieve, which is number four. And it states to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Now that involves everybody from small to old, from young, male or female, it doesn't matter. And the United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organization, the UNESCO, defines lifelong learning as follows. Rooted in the integration of learning and living, covering learning activities for people of all ages, children, young people, adults, and the elderly, girls and boys, women and men, in all life-wide contexts, families, school communities, workplace, and so on, and through a variety of formal, non-formal, and informal modalities. So I think that is what we should as a university, as a, as a tertiary institution going forward, we should keep in mind that we don't want to just equip students with a lot of credits at the end of the degree. We actually want to equip them with lifelong learning skills. Um, in conclusion, lifelong skills is beneficial to students. And we say that because it helps them with self-directed learning which enables them to take responsibility for what they are studying. Um, one of the links that links to the four pillars of lifelong learning is learning to know and learning to do, which is very important. And another aspect that we also want to highlight is the importance of personal and professional development. So that the students can grow and as a person be more employable, and also grow personally, because even if they don't study accounting, but they know Sage Pastel, they can help themselves with basic accounting pr uh, principles when they do their budgeting, for instance, by themselves. And our future research, we want to examine other modules that we can introduce lifelong learning. And we would also like to compare the findings of other modules with our findings in terms of lifelong learning. Thank you. That's my last slide. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you for bearing with me one more time. Um, my research or our research is focused on a student's perspective on the forced adoption of online learning at a private higher education institution. A summary of this presentation it basically consists of um, a background literature review methodology, findings, recommendations. The research objectives of the study was to identify higher education students' perceptions of online learning during COVID-19 when the South African government instituted a nationwide lockdown requiring teaching and learning to go online, as well as to determine what could have been done better to assist higher education students with their online learning during COVID-19. A little bit of background would be online learning benefits students who have the infrastructure to manage and navigate online learning platforms. Before democracy, the South African education system so divide between the education of different social classes, of which the effects are still evident. Transitioning from secondary education to tertiary education is one that sees a widening gap in access to higher education and graduation success, given the varying levels of exposure, infrastructure and experience students have to online learning. Exacerbating this was the COVID-19 pandemic, which required students to forcefully adopt online learning as a means of ensuring the continuation of 
the education. The presence of COVID-19 will have a long lasting and long reaching effect on South Africa. Considering that there's no cure for COVID-19 yet, higher education institutions must prepare to continue the manner that they have or adjust pre-COVID-19 teaching and learning methods to ensure students are provided with a quality education experience. Given the need to salvage the academic year and retain students, higher education institutions are favoring the online method of teaching and learning, given the increased uncertainty of when normalcy will return and students can safely resume face-to-face -face learning at full capacity. Therefore, the purpose of the study is to explore an area pertaining to students' perceptions of online learning that is under research within the Southern African context. Given the contemporary extenuating circumstances, many higher education is COVID-19. Given the diversity and multicultural nature of the South African higher education student, the education system too must be robust and amenable to developments, given that there's an increased focus on creating graduates that are also global citizens. Therefore, in view of the changing student demographic, increased competition and concerns regarding quality, higher education institutions must shift their teaching and learning approach to be more technologically focused in order to address these challenges. However, the needs of the world of work and the rapid evolution of technology is misaligned to the slow progression and transition of higher education institutions to increasing the incorporation of technology into lessons. Several authors concur that the requirements for online learning are hardware, software, the access and success thereof, as well as interpersonal factors. However, given the varying socioeconomic conditions of many South African students, not all students were equipped to take their learning online and the speed at the speed with which it was required. Thus, students that did not have a laptop, computer or smartphone, the prescribed textbooks and an adequate amount of data were severely disadvantaged. While most higher education institutions provided data and laptops to students to enable them to attend online classes and complete the assessments, the associated stress of the pandemic, lack of resources for online learning, a disruptive household environment, the lack of skills and experience for online learning and teaching, an unfamiliar area for both the lecturers and students, created much undue anxiety for all parties. There are circumstances where, despite the availability of information, there are events that occur which cannot be comprehensively considered and predicted. These events are known as a black swan. Black Swan events and their subsequent impacts have been noted to have a significant impact on human life, both in advancement and regression, which can often change the course of human life. The Black Swan theory serves as a critical theory that underpins the understanding of how COVID-19 could potentially aid all hinder nations. However, the theory does not fully explain the actions that must be taken as a result of the impact of COVID-19. As such, the contingency theory is used in conjunction with the Black Swan theory to underpin the study by way of explaining the impact of the virus as well as the contingency measures taken by higher education institutions. The contingency theory is used to study organizational behavior in reaction to variables such as culture, technology, and external conditions. When South African higher education institutions implement contingencies, these contingencies must be well thought out and fully understood by lecturers, support staff, IT support, as well as students to ensure that during implementation, it is in fact doable and well received. The approach taken by higher education institutions to adjust to the impact of no face-to-face -face classes 
was to implement online learning as a contingency. However, not all higher education institutions had the resources, capacities, and ability to migrate learning onto the online platform quickly and seamlessly. The research philosophy utilized an interpretivist view. The research approach was inductive in nature. The methodological approach followed was qualitative. The strategy of the study used interviews. The time horizon was cross-sectional and analyzed through thematic analysis. Some of the findings. So participants' perceptions were broadly related to the challenges and learning experiences given their own circumstances. The initial perception of participants towards the forced move online was negative, given the challenges students face. As a result, participants indicated that more could have or should have been done in terms of providing them with hardware and software, meaning laptops and um, Wi-Fi or data, timelessly. Many participants were not in a position to afford their own and relied heavily on the higher education institution to provide them with it in order for them to continue their education. However, as a result of a delay in assistance, many students either fell behind with their education or simply dropped out. By having access to resources such as Wi-Fi and or data, as well as the necessary hardware, students initially perceived the forced move online to online learning to be a challenge given that they were not equipped for the transition. Participants further expressed their discontent to the move online given that online learning was not the initial preferred mode of delivery. Participants specifically chose face-to-face -face learning given their personal desire to have a typical classroom experience. Thus, some participants indicated they experienced a mental block when it came to shifting to online learning. There was also an emotional response to the move online, where the uncertainty around COVID-19 resulted in an increased sense of anxiety towards successfully completing the education and then subsequently going back to campus and what that exposure could result in when they returned to their families. However, as online learning progressed, students' perceptions started to shift where there was now a greater sense of ownership of learning. However, despite not having sufficient initial training and preparation, participants undertook their own upskilling initiatives as a means of closing the gap in their online learning experiences. Much of the onus was on students to take ownership of their learning experience, and participants indicated the positive outcome was a more computer literate and technologically proficient student. Students indicated that the LMS provided them with the opportunity for asynchronous learning, which was handy given that most had to share devices of connectivity. As students learned more about COVID-19, they became increasingly aware of the risk it poses to themselves and those around them. Therefore, the perception of online learning was now a more favorable opinion, given the personal perception of students towards managing the effects of the virus. Overall, students' perception to the forced adoption remained divided. While some students expressed initial hesitancy, they soon grew to a level of comfort and competence with their ability to navigate online learning platforms. And thus they experienced a desire to continue online learning. However, there too was a significant number of participants that preferred to go back to campus. Given that it puts them in the right frame of mind to learn, given that the learning environment at home was not conducive enough to them. Some of the recommendations that can be put forward are higher education institutions 
can investigate the possibility of providing all students with a monthly data bundle to aid with online learning. This can be achieved by actively working with telecommunication networks to form partnerships and have them consider zero racing academic websites. Also allowing students a platform to buddy up with existing students as a means of mentorship and guidance specifically with, and lastly, providing training and workshops to students that promote online etiquette or netiquette and also practical classes to promote the integration of a learning management system into the learning environment. Yes, please. Um, the ongoing presence of the COVID-19 health pandemic has continuously forced higher education institutions to rethink their approach to online learning, as well as the support provided to students. At a time where emotions, tensions, and uncertainty around health and safety are at their peak, students at South African higher education institutions are facing an increased number of complexities, most of which can serve as a hindrance to their academic studies. Thus, the purpose of the study while identifying students' perceptions on the forced adoption of online learning that is unique to the prevalence of the black swan COVID-19 is to also identify measures that can assist higher education institutions in determining better support measures, thus enabling the development and employment of targeted interventions and support. Thank you colleagues and apologies once again for the disruption. Thank you. So um, two studies carried out in online for a language education courses in the 2020 and 21 academic year show that students especially valued hands-on collaborative tasks, engaging collaboratively in critical thinking and multimodal meaning-making processes, as well as receiving consistent feedback. Collaborative and active learning, along with flexibility and a pedagogy of care, have thus emerged as key dimensions of effective online learning in, a, in the new normal. As a result, to cater to students' needs in the new normal, a high flex, that is a hybrid flexible course outline, has been developed for foreign language teacher training or other disciplinary courses also taught through the medium of an additional language. In high flex courses, some students study in class while others study at a distance, either synchronously or asynchronously. The high flex course outline device is suited to design in digitally enhanced collaborative activities suitable for connecting students locally, that is from the same university, and globally, that is from different universities worldwide. The HighFlex course outline device features various digital collaborative learning activities designed using a design for learning approach, which fosters students' active learning and agency in online context. The HighFlex course outline relies extensively on digital technologies, instrumental in fostering students' multimodal meaning. Now I'm going to illustrate some key features of this HighFlex course outline, focusing on collaborative activities. As you can see, the HighFlex course outline adopts a flip learning approach. That is, students carry out some preparatory activities before class so that they can engage in active learning uh, during live classes. Due to time constraint, today um, I'm going to focus on in-class and distant learners who work collaboratively during synchronous classes. So in line with the pedagogy of care, live classes where in class and distance students study together synchronously, usually start with icebreaker activities. 
In general, activities are organized in small chunks. Um, jigsaws can work especially well during live classes. Breakout rooms here, as in all high flex collaborative activities, play a key role. Visualization can be especially useful to foster text comprehension by making underpinning semantic relationships surface. In this perspective, Moretti elaborates the concept of distant reading aimed at synthesizing the main features of a large amount of aggregated text data through the visualization of recurrent patterns. Distant reading entails identifying the main textual patterns and representing them through various kinds of visualization, from networks to charts, instrumental in making latent semantic relationships emerge. Although distant reading leads to a loss of semantic content in terms of granularity when compared to close reading, distant reading contributes to the surfacing of meaningful patterns underpinning text, including academic text. Moretti's distant reading can be operationalized through text mining, that is computational text analysis, which transforms unstructured which text they into structured and usable knowledge. Text mining is useful to detect patterns of text and thus uncover hidden semantic relationships. From an open pedagogy perspective, disciplinary text can thus be investigated through text mining. As a result, visualization-based topic analysis can be implemented fostering students' engagement in active knowledge making. Text mining enables students to carry out digital activities um, which could not be actually realized otherwise. Um, so text mining in fact enables end users to experiment with text analysis while engaging in critical thinking. Text mining driven activities trigger students' higher order thinking skills since through digital text analytics, students can deconstruct the text and as a result, understand it more thoroughly by investigating its patterns in a non-linear way. In general, students can analyze text using text mining before class. Students can thus engage in processes such as deconstructing academic texts, retrieving and organizing patterns of information on their own, and then share their findings in class through collaborative tasks such as jigsaws. In this respect, students can use voyants to carry out text mining driven activities. With voyant, students can also analyze genre-based features of academic texts. Students uh, can also use analytics to engage in topic modeling. Likewise, uh, students can use flair to analyze syntactical and grammatical features of academic texts. Um, after each class, so at the end of each live class in high flex courses, students carry out a reflection activity, which is pivotal to foster metacognition in online learning. Students can fill in a questionnaire, they can draw, they can post an image. Inclusion is thus fostered. As mentioned, students carry out some preparatory activities before class. During live classes, they can thus engage in collaborative activities, such as think, pair, share. That is, students think first individually how to address the problem or the scenario provided by the instructor. Then they discuss in pairs the issue provided and finally 
they share their findings or solutions with the class orally or through multimodal artifacts. Before class, um, students can annotate an article or a video collaboratively using perusal, which students really enjoy. Then during live classes, um, students can engage in peer instruction. Peer instruction, which is highly structured, features seven steps, including answering multiple choice questions and collaborative learning. Students can also engage in SOFLA, synchronous online flip learning approach, um, an online collaborative approach which features eight steps. Pre-work is usually carried out individually before class, while all the other steps, such as signity, whole group application, breakout group activities, share out time, preview and discovery, assignment, follow-up, and reflections, take place collaboratively during live classes. Before class, the students can argue for and against the hypothesis provided by the instructor and comment on their peers' ideas using Chialo. Then in class, students can engage in a liberating structure activity such as one, two, three, four, all. In one, two, three, four, all, um, students think first individually how to address the problem or the scenario provided by the instructor. Second, they discuss the issue in pairs. Third, they discuss the issue in groups of four. And finally, they share their findings or solutions with the class. During live classes, uh, in groups, students can also create digital mind maps to represent the newly introduced concept. Students can then peer review anonymously their peers' mind maps through peer grade and, as a result, modify their own mind maps on the basis of the peer review received. Students can engage uh, collaboratively in problem solving, or they can create a new product, or they can generate a new idea using Scamper, which consists of a series of strategies such as substituting, combining, adapting, magnifying, putting to other uses, eliminating, rearranging. It is students, and students can use all these strategies in the order they prefer. Students should use and represent visually the process they engage in to find a solution or to create a product or an idea. As a result, the process emerges as an added value of collaborative learning. In conclusion, to foster effective collaborative learning in high flex courses, Various strategies and activities can be used while at the same time catering for students' emotional and flexibility needs. Thank you.